welcome to Conversations on Careers in Social Work. My name is Jennifer Luna, and I'm a writer for the new Social Worker magazine. Uh, my column is Your Social Work Career Coach. And today, I'm so excited to have with us Becky Morales, who's a licensed clinical social worker and also a counseled approved supervisor. Uh, Becky serves currently as the program director for Flatwater Foundation, which we're going to talk about a little bit more because it's a really um, unique foundation uh, for people who are seeking counseling and have been impacted by a cancer diagnosis to different therapists in the community. She also practices uh, clinically at the Colors of Austin Counseling, where she provides individual psychotherapy that focuses on her work supporting the Latinx population uh, and those impacted by cancer, mental illness, life transitions, and loss and grief. Additionally, Becky is an adjunct professor at the Steve Hicks School of Social Work. And what's so fascinating also about Becky's career is that She's had many different roles, both in direct services, clinical practice, and administrative. Uh, she's really uh, been able to navigate the full world of social work um, by doing macro and clinical social work for several years. So Becky, I want to thank you and welcome you to our show today. Thanks so much, Jennifer. I'm glad to be here. So um, one of the reasons why I was so excited about interviewing you was because of your uh, diverse career um, in our profession, probably um, one of the most diverse that I've ever seen in my career. And so while the uh, primary focus is going to be on primary on uh, private practice, um, I would also like for you to start by just telling us a little bit about your career path. Sure. Well, I am definitely one of those individuals that has a lot of different interests um, kind of within social work practice. And as you mentioned, I've been really fortunate enough to have a really um, eclectic, I think, set of experiences in, in my career. I initially getting out of graduate school envisioned that I would at some point in time want to be an executive director. And so definitely much more macro oriented and um, knew before I did that, that I wanted to have a, a pretty solid set of clinical uh, experiences under my belt to help inform my approach to uh, program management and, and things of that sort. So I started my career doing intensive medical case management and counseling um, with families of kids with uh, chronic and terminal conditions, including cancer. And from there, just really kind of evolved in a lot of different ways of moving into roles that were entirely programmatic, like you mentioned, um, and in roles that were entirely focused on direct service. So I have uh, spent a lot of my career focused in healthcare in some form or fashion, a lot within chronic illnesses and cancer um, in particular but have also had the opportunity to have really um, interesting administrative roles like grant and contract management for the state of Texas and um, supporting uh, local nonprofit organizations around the state and providing technical assistance to help their programs operate more smoothly as they were utilizing um, funds to be able to support people in their community. Uh, so I've had just really great opportunities uh, throughout the course of my career to practice in a lot of different settings. I've worked in really small nonprofits. Uh, as I mentioned, I've worked for the state. I've worked um, inpatient in a hospital setting. I've worked a lot in specialty care clinics, outpatient clinics, um, and probably everything in between and have finally gotten myself to a spot in my career that I think I've figured out that having a lot of diversity in my work is what I appreciate most. And it allows me to, I think, stay rejuvenated and excited and passionate about my work, but also taps into all of the skills that, um, that I 
that I have. And so that's where I'm kind of at the point now of having a full-time job that is entirely administrative and, and programmatic, as you mentioned, uh, with Flatwater Foundation. I also continue to clinically practice as a, as a member of Colors of Austin Counseling. And then I also teach on the side. And this uh, really gives me a lot of um, growth in my career. I get, I'm constantly challenged in a lot of different ways and um, really get to tap into a strong generalist um, social work skill set that I have. So I feel really fortunate to have been able to work in a lot of different settings um, and in a lot of different functional roles. How long have you been practicing, Becky? Oh, gosh, it will. It's close to 20 years. Um, so I'm at about 19 and a half years right now. I graduated um, in 2003. And did you do a clinical track or a macro track? I was a student that had a really hard time deciding that <laughs> I um, struggled with that tremendously. Um, probably by no, no big surprise, as you hear that I've done a lot of things in my career, I ultimately concentrated on the administrative, um, administrative practice side of things um, within my, my graduate program and was fortunate enough to be able to take a couple of elective courses on the clinical track as well. So had a little bit of a foundation and some more intensive clinical courses, but really most of my clinical training is, has really happened out, out in um, the community and in the various jobs that I've had throughout my career. That's such a great um, career story because uh, so many uh, students that I meet um, will do clinical thinking that they can always go back and get the macro skills as opposed to what you did, which was macro, and then went back and got the clinical skills. Uh, yeah. Would you say that was a challenge or how did that come about? Um, I, you know, I think for me, well, I mean, I mentioned that it was a challenge for me to decide where I wanted to concentrate, you know, kind of within my, my degree focus. I, I ultimately went administrative route because I, I tend to think more macro oriented initially, even, okay. even when I am working, um, you know, kind of within my clinical practice and maybe sitting alongside a client, I am typically thinking, yes, about the person that I'm sitting alongside and kind of what they may be sharing with me. But I'm also thinking about the systemic influences of things that are exacerbating what their experience and their day to day experience um, in life. And so I'm, I'm, I'm often thinking about those bigger picture things yeah. first or simultaneously. And I just, for me, my, I think I just leaned into where my natural kind of thought process and learning style is and where my strength is in that regard. Um, really recognizing that most important to me was to have a solid foundation in generalist skills, knowing that I'm a lifelong learner and those, those clinical skills, as well as those administrative skills, I'm going to have opportunities to continue growing and building my skill set. Um, so I don't, I can't say that it was really challenging. I think if, it, if the challenge was in me being afraid, I think, um, <laughs> to trust myself and to trust, um, my instincts and leaning into just kind of what felt most comfortable for me. Um, and not feeling like I needed to, like the decision I made when I was working on my degree was going to set the course of, of kind of what I did forever in my career. Tell us a little bit more about the Flatwater Foundation. Yeah, Flatwater Foundation is a nonprofit that's based uh, here in Austin, Texas. And we are an organization that exists to eliminate barriers for folks um, impacted either directly or indirectly by a cancer diagnosis in getting access to mental health services. Um, so what I, I do is support folks that are in need of service and get them matched with a, a local therapist within our community. Um, and we've got a number of different therapists kind of here within Central Texas that uh, partner with us as an organization. And it allows me to be able to support individuals um, needing mental health support, um, get them access to care. And for those who those individuals who wouldn't otherwise be able to access this support, our organization covers the cost of their care for however long um, they are experiencing any cancer-related stressors. Do y'all serve both clients or patients and their families? 
We do. Yeah. Yeah. So anybody, I mean, one of the, one of the hallmarks of the organization and, um, and kind of where the whole flat water um, idea comes from is recognizing that when a cancer diagnosis hits, there's ripples, um, ripple effects for everyone involved. You know, it's not just the individual that's been diagnosed, but it's coworkers, it's kids, it's, you know, siblings, it's partners. And, and our goal is to be able to get access to this mental health support so that folks can return back to their flat water. And um, so that being said, we, we serve kind of folks that are directly or indirectly impacted by cancer. So a lot of caregivers and um, kids, both adult Um, adult children and minor children as well. Wow, that's great. What a um, a needed service. Absolutely, yeah. Um, So seeing as you've kind of dabbled in all types of social work, how did you build your practice? It's a great question. Um, I think for, for me, going into the group private practice route is a newer thing that I've done in the sense of my, my career traje- trajectory. So being out, you know, 19 and a half years out in, the, in this work, it was only a little over three years ago that I felt like I was ready to kind of dabble in, in that area of practice. Um, and so chose to do so and really wanted intentionally to focus my, my clinical work, um, first and foremost with folks in the Latinx community. I know as a member of that community myself, how powerful it has been to have a, have my own therapist who looks like me and, um, shares a similar background, just, just culturally that has been really powerful. And, um, and that representation matters. So for me as a clinician, I was real intentional about wanting to, to support that population as well. In addition to being able to support, um, folks that are impacted by cancer and other chronic illnesses, because that has continued to be a a really big um, part of my career and, and just a great passion of mine, both professionally as well as personally. What advice would you give to somebody who has been out of school for, you know, maybe 10 years and has not done uh, therapy in a private practice type setting um, that might have some trepidation about going that route? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I, I I always think that there's such great value in community and in getting clini- getting connected with other clinicians. Um, I think you know one thing I appreciate about the the community here in Austin, where I live, is that there there is a, a great amount of networking. I think amongst clinicians uh, within our community, and so I think kind of you know reaching out and connecting with other clinicians, maybe that are doing some work and with certain populations that you might be interested in or um, anything like that. I think grabbing a cup of coffee with some, with someone and just connecting, understand how, how they got to be where they're at. Um, But I also think, you know, there's, there's often opportunities to um, whether it's, it's kind of work, you know, a handful of hours kind of beginning to just dabble in seeing, you know, seeing a few individuals here or there or volunteering to get some experience, yeah. maybe it's facilitating a group or working for a local nonprofit that maybe allows you to slowly get a little bit of, of practice. Um, and then of course, you know, I think exploring, um, the route of, you know, clinical supervision, you know, if, if you're an individual that maybe wants to ultimately pursue that clinical licensure um, in, in whatever state you may live in, but, and if not that, at a minimum being in consultation um, and, and just talking with other clinicians, you know, I myself, I've, I have had my clinical license for quite a number of years now, and I still continue to be in consultation, both individually and in groups. Um, so, you know, several different groups, usually at a time, maybe with some different um, clinicians or, or different um, 
it might be different interventions that I'm using or something like that. It's continuing to not do my work in isolation and continuing to get support from other like-minded practitioners and just learning and growing and also have those cheerleaders around you when you have those like doubts about if you're doing something okay or if there's maybe something you're missing. I just think that's a really, that's a really important part of, of social work practice for sure. Can you tell us, uh, how do you, if you don't have, say you're in a practice where there aren't a lot of other therapists or LCSWs, how do you seek out consultation? And do you have to pay for it? Um, I, I get a lot of questions about that. Yeah, I think it's probably, I, I think in terms of cost, I think it's probably all over the place. I would say okay. I, I've definitely been a part of some consultation groups that um, there hasn't been any cost involved, but it has been more of a commitment of the clinicians in mm -hmm. that group um, to commit to attending, you know, if it's every other week or, or something of that sort for a period of time. Um, and I also do consultation where I am paying my consultant. Um, in particular, I'm, I'm working towards my certification in eye movement desensitization and reprocessing or EMDR. Yeah. And that takes some time. I work with the same consultant on a regular basis. And, and I, of course, compensate them for, for their services as I'm pursuing my certification. So I think it's a little bit of both. Um, and in terms of kind of where does somebody find those things, I think, again, I think, um, I think it is within the community and within the, within the network. I definitely found my consultant through a, um, a mental health, uh, Facebook group that oh. is specific to therapists of color here in, in the Austin area. The other consultation groups I've been a part of, it's I knew colleagues that were maybe kind of starting something up and kind of got yeah. in on it at the beginning. And so I definitely think, as I mentioned earlier, just that networking piece um, and that community uh, piece is really important. And it allows you to kind of, you know, insert yourself and, and get your needs met, which I think is really important um, and does require, I think, being a little proactive in that sense to, to kind of, you know, seek out intentionally what you're looking for. I know that uh, one of your um, uh, values and, and part of your passion is working with uh, the Latinx population. How do you engage the Latinx population or, or you know, any uh, populations of um, color or ability, disability? How, how do you find those clients? Or do they find you? Well, yeah, I think... Um... They have man I've, I've managed to be sought out, which yeah. um, I, I think is I, I don't know that I quite expected that uh, when I made that when I made that leap into into private practice. But I found that, um, you know, similar to, to myself, when I've been on my own um, search for a therapist, um, you know, I'm looking for someone that that relates to me in a lot of ways. And, and ethnically, for me, that's an important thing. And I think that's oftentimes what I hear from from folks that are reaching out to me um, is, is that is that connection, you know, strange, strangely enough, because, you know, we're talking about this diversity in my, you know, in my career path, I've, I've also been sought out by individuals that maybe not necessarily identify as part of the, the Latinx community, but that maybe um, are in similar, doing similar work like myself in the sense of doing some type of clinical practice of some form or fashion, but then also doing some teaching or having some academic yeah. connection as well. And so that's been a little bit of surprise for me as well in terms of people um, knowing that I have some different roles and responsibilities um, just kind of within my professional work and being sought out for that because I do think having that experience from the academic side of, of things is also really unique as well. And so another way that I've been a little bit surprised at, at kind of who, who has sought me out for services. I, I have to confess, it's probably me. <laughs> because I tell everybody about, because honestly, you are, you know, one of the most diverse social workers I've ever worked with. And um, I, I, you're high on my list. Um, no. when, are looking for that. So well, I appreciate um, that. But I think, I mean, to go, you know, a little bit further, just in terms of your, your question, Jennifer, is, 
I, I think a starting a starting point for me with anyone that I begin to to be of service to is is starting with identity and just understanding right. how does somebody identify in the world, what's important to them, um, and and that's really consistent with with my approach and my way of being in the world. There are really salient aspects of my identities that are important and that I want to be able to share with other people. And so, um, you know, that's, that's really, you know, it's never a one-time conversation, but that's also something that's been, you know, really critically important um, when I begin my, my work with anyone, whether that's, you know, someone who maybe, you know, joining me in a private practice setting or even students that I work with or anything like that, just that understanding um, those salient identities that someone holds and, and honoring those. I, it, I think it also has to do with the authenticity of your brand, you know, your professional brand. You um, are very authentic and what you see is what you get and it doesn't change. It's consistent across all platforms. And I think that's really important for um, us as social workers to, to know and to practice, because if we aren't our authentic selves, then it's going to be hard to fake it. And um, it's worked very well for you. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I <laughs> wish I could tell you that it was always like that and that it felt easy to lean into that. I mean, I think that that's something yeah. that I, I, I agree with at this stage in my career. Mm -hmm. And when I think about earlier on in my career, I was afraid to lean into that. I right. was afraid. I felt the pressures of needing to establish myself or conform right. or what have you. Um, and, and what I've learned most from the people that I've had the honor of serving throughout the course of my career is that the authenticity and the absence of that, just there, there can't be much. Um, and so I think that that has really enabled me to, to grow in comfort and, and leaning into that a great deal. That's the perfect lead into my next question. Um, as you think about your career and uh, your legacy, um, what is there anything you would have done differently? Um, like say towards the beginning of your career, is there anything that um, you would have been more intentional about or maybe um, would have done differently? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think, one of the things that I'm I'm pretty open in talking about is that I, I wish I would have been much more open and transparent about how hard it was um, oh as a new practitioner. Yeah. And, you know, recognizing all the things that I just mentioned, you know, the, the pressure of establishing yourself in a in in a in a field and um, you know, wanting to build your brand as you're taught, as you're saying, like, I don't think I knew that when I was getting out of graduate school, I just knew that there was this, you know, kind of pressure to, to deliver in a lot of right, different right. ways. And, and I wish, I think that's a really common thing. And I know that now, and it's something that I still struggle with in, in various ways. I'm just much more open about talking about it and not being afraid of, of it. And I wish I would have been doing that earlier on in my career, instead of um, feeling like I was going to be bothering people if I was talking to them about these struggles or that there was some, that I should have had it figured out because I came yeah. out with a master's degree. And so therefore I should, I should just have all the answers. And I just, I, I think when I began to embrace and be more comfortable with the fact that I am going to continue to learn and grow throughout the course of my career, and I'm going to also continue to make mistakes and um, being able to be comfortable with that and, and learn from that and never be complacent is, um, you know, has been, I think, probably some of the greatest learnings I've done in this career and something, you know, that I wish I would have been just more comfortable with earlier on. Excellent. Uh, do you think that also um, serving as a, a field instructor or doing adjunct work um, help? kind of helps that along as well, like seeking out those opportunities. I know you've done a lot of presentations um, at conferences and things like that. Yeah, I definitely, I, I definitely think so. I mean, it's, I, I think those things can be very intimidating. Um, right. I think, you know, I started doing field instruction, I think about two and a half, maybe three years after I had gotten out of graduate school. So really early on in my career. 
And I loved it then. I love it now when I have the opportunity to do it. And it's also challenging. It's, um, you know, it being, being okay with um, students or learners being curious about what you're doing and not being threatened by that. Um, and, and those have been things that I've, I, that's one of the reasons I continue to teach as, as a part of the adjunct faculty is just, I, I love that I become a better practitioner because of mm -hmm. the research I have to continue to do to prepare for my classes over the course of a semester, but just the curiosity and the questions I get from, from those that I have the honor of sharing classroom space with, like it, it, it helps. I, I take more from those interactions than I think most students probably ever realize, but it absolutely helps me to continue to grow as a practitioner. That's great. I, I, I think that's one of the um, best things about working with um, young learners. And, and I don't mean young in age, but whether it's teaching or um, being a supervisor or anything like that, I just think it's so great to always have that challenge of, of, of being with just other learners. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you see is next on the horizon for you? Oh, gosh. Um, that's a really great question, Jennifer. And, and most people that know me and have followed my career know that I don't tend to stay in one place very long. But I will tell you, I have, I really feel like I um, am at the best part of my career and a very rejuvenated spot, I think, largely because of the diversity within my work. And I'm really passionate yeah. about everything that I am doing. And so I don't know what's next for me. Um, you know, I I love I love everything that I'm doing right now, and and find a lot of energy and nourishment from it. So, um, I don't know. It's a good. It's a really good question. I definitely I continue to grow in terms of my clinical practice and um, want to continue to do that. Whether that's kind of getting more intensively trained and maybe different. Um, uh, interventions or modalities that I'm not as familiar with so far. So that's most definitely a big, uh, a, a, will be a continued focus for me. But in terms of other jobs, I don't know. I'm, I, who know, who knows? You never know what I might kind of jump into. <laughs> that's <next>. right. <laughs> but I do know that uh, with the, the, the work you're doing now, that it was very strategic. I remember us talking about it uh, last year that you know you had come to a point where you know the things that you do want to do and you know what you don't want to do and getting to that process I, it was um so awesome to to watch that from the other side oh well thank you and also i mean i think our relationship and the work we've done together like i I, I feel like I have to honor you for just as much as you're you're acknowledging me because you know that's you've been a witness to my my career yeah. um, trajectory and movement and and a lot of coaching and guidance from you in terms of you, you know reassuring me if I was making the right next steps and in, in going in you know different jobs or different organizations and so I have to give you a lot of credit in that regard too but is also a testament of not not trying to be a practitioner in in a silo really right. really leaning into um you know mentors and sources of support to to help you as you're navigating making some of these decisions throughout your career well um as we as we finish up our time here i want to ask you what advice would you give to social workers um at any stage um in terms of making a change oh Yeah, I think, I, you know, I think one of the best things that someone said to me, and, and I, maybe it was you, I don't know, someone <laughs> gave me this, this piece of, of wisdom that has just continued to stay with me, is being mindful if I'm in, if, you know, if someone is in a situation where they feel like they need to make a change, like being intentional and, and mindful of Am I, am I running, running from something or am I running towards something? Um, and, and, and I don't know when some, when, when somebody gave me that beautiful nugget, um, but I have just held on to that because I've, 
you know, been in def definitely some different professional situations where I felt like I needed a change and I had to kind of zoom out and take a step back mm -hmm. and realize like, is this, is this something, a temporary stressor that maybe with some time will, will kind of relax and that that's overall a good situation that makes sense for my career and what I'm doing. And in that sense, something like, would I be trying to run away from something or am yeah. I really running, running and moving towards something that is in alignment with my values, is in alignment with my goals, um, makes sense for me on a personal level as well as the professional level. Um, and so I, I think that would be, I know I've definitely gotten more comfortable with that as I've gotten more experience um, in my career. Um, and something I don't think is really easy, in, you know, in certain instances, but, right. you know, really, really being intentional about that, I think is what I would, would say. And, and again, continuing to talk to people about that mm -hmm. and, and, you know, just get some, get support from people wherever you need it. I love that nugget. I didn't say that, but I'm going to <laughs> point forward. <laughs> I claim it. You can take that. I will. Okay. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you so much for your time today. And um, for our viewers, we will have Becky's um, information uh, at the at the end of the video. And if you have any questions for myself or Becky, please drop us a line in the comments on the YouTube channel. And again, thank you so much, Becky. You're so welcome, Jennifer. Thanks for having me.